MT Data Fleet Tracking Systems are highly customizable to meet customer needs. Here is an overview of the main system components, which may vary depending on the specific customer configuration. At the heart of all systems is the tracking unit. The 4000 series includes the standard 4102, the 4105 with internal satellite modem, and the IAP compliant 4109. Other models include the 5080 or 3026. The tracking unit includes a GPS receiver and cellular modem. All of the peripheral components we're about to look at connect to this tracking unit. The peripherals are a CAN bus module, which connects to the vehicle to access parameters like engine data and odometer readings. It connects to the tracking unit via a serial port. For remote operations, an external satellite modem. It's used not for GPS position, but to transmit and receive data when out of cellular range. A cellular antenna, available in standard or high gain versions. A digital video recorder, or DVR which is connected to the tracking unit via an Ethernet cable. It has hardwired cameras, its own GPS antenna for accurate time stamping, and a power connection. A microphone and speaker for hands-free phone functionality. A GPS antenna for the main tracking unit. An input-output or I.O. harness, which allows connection of a variety of devices like a duress or man down switch and can also provide power to devices like an external satellite modem. And either a hardwired monitor or a Wi-Fi connected tablet, which is the driver's interface to the whole system. The tracking unit has a set of status LEDs for immediate troubleshooting. They are firmware dependent, so their exact operation can vary, but they're a good starting point for ensuring the unit is powered up and has cellular and GPS signals. Now let's take a look at the connectors on the 4000 series tracking units. First of all, we have the power connections. Black is earth, red is 12 or 24 volt permanent power, and yellow is ignition power. The speaker also uses this connector with purple wires. Next we have the I.O. harness. This will vary depending on customer requirements, so you'll need to check the schematic diagram for the specific configuration you're working on. Adjacent to the I.O. harness is a connector where the tamper switch and ignition power are connected in IAP applications only. Then we have the microphone connection for the phone. There's a screw-in retaining stopper to prevent the plug from working loose. The blue connector is for the GPS antenna. Green is for an antenna for the internal satellite modem. And purple is for the cellular antenna. The actual cellular and GPS antennas used on a particular installation will depend on customer requirements. On the other side of the tracking unit, we have two 9-pin RS-232 serial ports, which we refer to as port A, or the outer port, and port B, or the inner port. These can connect various devices depending on customer configuration. A common serial device is the 1034 CAN bus interface, to obtain vehicle engine or odometer data. The CAN bus module connections are yellow for ignition and black for earth. For J1708 CAN bus connections, it's the orange and white uninsulated pair. And for J1939, it's the insulated blue and white pair. White is always the high side. These are wired into a CAN bus connector which plugs into the vehicle, with the pinout being determined by the make and model of the vehicle. Another serial device is the external satellite modem. It has its own earth, power and ignition power leads, but the yellow ignition power lead is not used. The constant power lead is connected to the I.O. harness so that the tracking unit can command the modem to turn on as needed when cellular signal drops out. The modem may plug directly into the tracking unit or use a serial extension cable or even a Y adapter cable if another device is attached. There are also other peripherals that can be attached, for example a swipe card reader or keypad for drivers to clock on and off, or third-party trailer scales, which can send their data back via the serial port. The next connector is a standard USB port. This is used for the Wi-Fi dongle, which allows the tracking unit to communicate with a tablet. Further along, we have an RJ45 Ethernet jack. This is for connection to the DVR. And finally, we have a power connector, 
It's identical to the one on the other side, and can be used if access to this side suits the installation better. You may need to open the tracking unit to install or remove SIM cards, micro SD cards, or other components. To open it, first undo the two retaining screws. Hold the top and bottom of the shell in each hand, like this, and gently wiggle them directly apart. Avoid pulling it up by one side, as you could bend connecting pins. When closing the unit, be very careful that the top and bottom pieces are properly aligned. And then gently apply even pressure until it snaps shut. Inside the unit, there are two SIM card slots on the top board and two micro SD card slots on the bottom. The SIM card slots have a hinged locking system. This slot shown, which is always used, is the primary slot. The other slot is used only for IAP applications. The micro SD card slots have a spring-loaded push-to-release mechanism. This slot shown must be fitted with an industrial-grade card. A consumer-grade card may be used in the second slot. Now let's take a closer look at the DVR. On the front, you can see it has its own set of status lights for quick troubleshooting. There's an infrared port for receiving commands from the remote control, and two USB ports for updating the firmware. Here are the connectors on the back of the unit. First of all, there's the GPS antenna. The antenna is mounted sticky side up, usually under the dash. Next we have the camera inputs. The numbering convention for the cameras is one for the forward facing camera, two for the rear facing camera, and three and four for left and right. The connectors are interchangeable, so it's important to ensure each one is in the correct socket. As well as receiving the video signal from the cameras, each camera is also powered from the DVR via this connector. The cameras contain infrared LEDs for nighttime illumination, but the forward facing camera has these disconnected to prevent them from reflecting off the windscreen and back into the camera. If you're replacing the forward facing camera, you'll need to open it up by undoing the three hex screws and then the four small screws from the back of the camera head. You'll see that the printed circuit board inside has red and black power cables to each LED. Disconnect the red leads and isolate them. When reinstalling the camera, note that by default, the light sensor indicates the bottom of the image, so this should be positioned at the bottom. The next connector is for the video output harness. Individual camera outputs are not used in normal operation, but they can be used with a monitor to test for video output from each camera. The main DVR output lead is used with an analog video monitor to access the configuration menu for updating firmware or settings. Next is the RJ45 connector for the Ethernet cable which connects the DVR to the tracking unit. Then we have the I.O. harness which also connects back to the tracking unit. This is used for driving an output when the DVR has an event like tampering, power outage, etc. Full details of these connections can be found in the DVR schematic diagram. Next is an RS-232 serial port, but this is not used. It has the same type of physical connector as the GPS antenna, so if the DVR is not receiving GPS time sync, check that the GPS antenna hasn't been accidentally plugged in here. Finally, there's the power connector. The connections are ignition power, constant power, and earth. Note that the color coding for ignition and constant power is reversed from that of the tracking unit with yellow for constant power and red for ignition. To wrap up, let's take a look at the power wiring for the tablet. The tablet is mounted in a cradle for charging. The cradle is powered via a cigarette lighter type connector, which is wired to 12 volt permanent power, not ignition power. The connector contains a 5 volt regulator, so connecting the tablet directly to vehicle power could damage it. It can be secured with cable ties fixed lengthwise or heat shrink tubing. Wrapping electrical tape around it is not recommended as the glue tends to soften and then the tape can end up pushing the connector apart. A cable tie secures the power plug into the back of the cradle. Thanks for watching. For more diagnostic and operation tips, see also our other videos.